In the 1990s, I was living in London, working as a psychotherapist and um, also quite a political person. And um, I, I became involved with quite an exciting question and quite an exciting group of people who are asking this question, which is how come humans are being so destructive in the, in the dominant society to the earth? And how come psychotherapy and counselling and those kinds of psychology aren't really addressing that? Um, so the question of what would a green psychology like? What, what do we who work with the questions of the human psyche, what do we have to offer to environmentalism? Um, became a very interesting question. And many environmentalists found themselves training, for example, in counselling or therapy, because in the end they went, the real environmental issue here is the state of human consciousness, and I need to know more about why humans are destructive, how we change, how we heal. So I'd been very involved in what we came to call eco-psychology before I moved to Devon. So I was very moved by learning that indigenous people live in a way where the outer world, where the earth and the beings of the earth are animate and are not separate from our inner lives. So I came to see that in sustainable human cultures, inner worlds and outer world are not separated in the way they are in the dominant Western world, which is so destructive to the planet. So for me, this was a very key insight and I became very interested in how do we heal that split between our, and I came to call it a split, between our inner worlds, which is separate from what we're doing out there in, in, in the world of material consumption. Uh, I had been living in London for a very long time, uh, working as a psychotherapist uh, and with a background in engineering and sciences. So even within psychotherapy, I was really interested in kind of systemic approaches. So I trained as a family constellator, which is a way of looking not just at the individual, but kind of the individual in the system of their family and their ancestors. And I'd come across Joanna Macy's work as well, the work that reconnects and done some, met eco-psychology, read some of, some of the books um, of eco-psychology. So I, I had an interest in the kind of wider application of um, of psychotherapy and you know not just looking at personal pathology but wider systems um, and I'd been playing a lot of football and you know doing IT training so I wasn't particularly in an activist kind of field um, and then I came to move to Devon and, and a bit like Hillary you know much more recently arrived and before I'd started any work found the transition movement starting, Naresh and Rob were showing the first films. Um, Hilary and I had met through the eco-psychology group, so there was a, a, a group of people interested in that kind of field. So yeah, that's where I was, looking for something to do. I remember going into Totnes to see one of the first public meetings that Rob had organised. It was a sunny, evening in June on a Friday for, for a political meeting and uh, it was sold out. We did, I didn't even get into the first meeting and I had an immediate sense this was an extraordinary process that was quite unused, unlike uh, tired of politics with which I was familiar. I was very moved by that and a group of us went and talked in the pub because we couldn't even get into the meeting. I tried again the next week and went to a film about Cuba uh, to see kind of what was happening and might there be something that we had to offer that, uh, from an inner dimension or was it all really already happening? This is a, a town with lots of meditation and therapy and uh, was there anything particular that it needed doing? And what impacted me was two or three older male speakers as it happened who stood up uh, talking about Cuba and said, Do you know what? I remember the war, people come together in a crisis, but until we're in a real crisis, nothing will change. That's what hum humans are like. That's just the nature of humanity. And I had a sense of a kind of deep level of depression, really, in that comment, and nobody particularly disagreed within the audience. And at that moment, I made my personal decision, which went, mm, I think maybe we can do better than that. I think there are, there's a whole movement 
in consciousness movement for people who are drawn to work with consciousness who are going no way ch change happens from a place of much greater vision and possibility not only in crisis when we're forced to with a fairly dim view of what humans are like which was really what was being presented by those particular people um, from that moment i emailed rob and spoke about who i was and my interest he emailed me straight back and said wonderful why don't you start a psychology of change group and I had a little exchange with him about might we be including spirituality and other aspects of consciousness and it got left open so I thought well maybe maybe we'll do all these three things and pull together as I might very much like in starting in the psychology group in London just put out the call of anybody I could think of who might possibly be drawn to this work and we had our first meeting, which of course Sophie came to, and the rest also. Um, and as I have consistently found in this arena, there are a number of people who are very drawn, who immediately see the significance and power and potency of saying, what do we know about inner lives and our personal transformation, healing of our own wounds, that relates to human presence on the planet Earth. What is, how do we put these two together? So in this instance, what would it mean to put inner and outer, I used to call it ecos and psyche, back together in one political movement? So this political movement doing many, many practical things with food, transport, housing, etc., etc., would also have a working group and a dimension looking at inner transformation. So what we actually did was, it was Rob's idea, wasn't it, was to say, why don't you do a launch? So they were preparing for the big launch of Transition Town Top Nest. I think I'd just about got a name by then. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd never, isn't it, we'd never thought of doing a launch. That was the thing that, they've done that before, but we put posters mm -hmm. up and let people know about it. Um, and, and I remember in those early days of TTT, at every event you were going, how many people are we going to have? And you'd have to guess, because you didn't know if 10 people or 300 people would walk through the door. Yeah. Um, and we were guessing, I think, around 20. And then we had 55 people mm -hmm. at that first launch. You gave a very beautiful talk about the, some of the themes you've just been speaking about, eco-psychology and its kind of background. Uh, what else? We had somebody sing. We, well, we did a Joanna Macy practice. That's right, we yeah. We did a double circle in which, actually, so we did a live process on the evening mm -hmm. in which people speak to the, both the fears for the future and what's difficult in, in happening and their concerns for that, and simultaneously um, there was a vision of what, what may happen. So both yeah. the ancestors and the future beings were brought into that circle. Yeah, mm. that's right. And we did a kind of, uh, we, we had everybody stand and we and just kind of call in mm. if this group really succeeded, what mm. kind of things might it bring into being and what would the qualities of, mm. you know, be that it, that it brought. And a little brainstorm about, you know, what would you like to see this group actually doing. Mm. Um, so people left that meeting feeling very positive. And I think the thing, mm. we, we already had a few events, didn't we, that we were organising. So I was doing a, a kind of, Ecological Constellations Workshop, you did a Truth Mandala. Mm. Several of those early events kind of cr almost created a very positive energy and field. Mm. You, you were very excited in, in running that workshop and the people came from across Devon. There was a tremendous kind of excitement and sense of possibility and almost of being blessed actually, mm. wasn't there at that time. Yeah, I did the Truth Mandala which was working more with yeah. grief. I, I could go back to say why it was called Heart and Soul, which you may want to include or not, which is that Rob initially spoke about the head, heart and hands of transition, uh, which is, you know, the three parts of human life, isn't it? And I thought, well, clearly we have the heart that we're going to be working with. And I thought, I think, although it hasn't been said, we've got spirit and soul, we, we're working with both the psychological and the spiritual dimension of transition. Mm -hmm. So that's where the name Heart and Soul came from which was later changed to inner transition so it would be clearer, but it is, it is the, heart, the, the psychological and spiritual dimensions that we were very blessed in feeling a kind of unfolding of possibility around the kind of things we might offer and how they might feed into the practical process. Yeah. 
the only bit I was going to add was, isn't it, Lana, at that first big launch, the one thing that we had set to invite people to, as well as the events, was we set a date for our first meeting. So that there was, you know, it's an easy structure then for people to say, yes, I'll come to that first meeting without having to know, am I going to, you know, am I signing my life away? Am I going to join mm -hmm. a group kind of forever? But, you know, we're going to continue this exploration together. So it felt like that launch was just a very inviting... Mm. You know, this has never happened before, wasn't it? We've never done this before, mm -hmm. but let's see what we can figure out together. Mm -hmm. So that was the kind of initial, yeah, process by which we got the group started. I, I tend to think that if I have an overview, because a lot happened of kind of, I don't know, three particular categories of, of what we did, mm. really. Um, and one of them was offering dedicated spaces, if you like, for developing inner transition work, whether it's support for people, um, so pr processing work, to process feelings around what's happening or inquiry into the whole thing. So that included the workshops or the open space day that you facilitated so beautifully, which was an amazing day, you might want to say more about that. Um, or later on setting up the mentoring scheme or the home groups project, so lots of stuff that supported people to do, to do inner work, if you like, around transition, and that people who were drawn to that side could then join, join this movement who might not otherwise have joined it. Um, but there was also bringing process into the rest of the transition movement into conferences and meetings, which I guess you know more about. And there was also having outside speakers actually bringing their own dimension. So I tend to think everything we did would probably go under those three headings. I don't know. Yeah, so we were very blessed, weren't we, in Totnes, because we have Schumacher just up the road, mm. and we, we brought in and, and hosted in town some really fantastic kind of world-class speakers. We had Peter mm. Russell, didn't we, early on, and mm. Marianne Williamson. Um, so that was a huge bonus for all of Transition Town Totnes. Mm. Uh, yeah, and I think we were kind of contributing something to the core group, um, mm. So both of you, both you and I, went to the core group meetings that had representatives from each of the working groups, and I think we were just bringing an awareness of process both into how those meetings were run, but also, you know, when we were encountering difficult dynamics or you know questions about dynamics with other groups in the town, mm. having a kind of understanding of you know relational dynamics just helped all of that to go quite smoothly, mm. I think. Um, one of the things that I really noticed in a, in a lot of meetings is that the, the big focus was on the doing. You know, the agendas would be very packed and it would all be about projects and activities and, um, you know, and, and actually, you know, we, we would have very skilled chairs who would even manage to get us through this very packed agenda, but there was no time to reflect on was that a good way to run a meeting? Do people feel included in the decision making? Are we doing a good job of collaborating within mm. this organisation? Um, how are people doing? So, you know, one of the first things that you and I brought to the core group of Transition Town Totnes was the question, are we actually personally sustainable? And, the, you know, at that first or second core group meeting, we, we realised that we weren't. You know, the paradox of a movement about sustainability is that many people burn out. Um, so all of those kind of things, you know, how are mm. we not just attending to the doing, but also attending to the relational field mm. within the organisation, the well-being of each of us. And there's something also that can get left out, which is about structures. You know, we need good structure, that we understand our roles, that we have a clear decision-making process, um, mm. in order to help people to feel included as part of the, the kind of power structure mm. of the organisation. many groups people step out, the oh. original vocalizers step out, and then there isn't anybody to carry on. And I remember that being a dilemma for us for quite a time, how can we step out? We invited other people to step in and we never quite got that to work. But then we really thought about the process of handing over. Do you remember when we had that meeting mm -hmm. and we listed out on flip chart all the things that we'd been doing yeah. <laughs> to, to get to run that group? And actually, yeah. I was a member being astonished at the yeah. list, how long that list was. Yeah. Um, and what did we do? We wrote that list up. I don't know, it was another meeting with about 17 or 20 people. 
And I think we just invited, we said, would anybody, mm. you know, you don't have to take all of this on, but could anybody take a little bit of this list? And someone said they could do the emails and someone said they mm -hmm. would do the public meetings and someone said they could represent us at core group. And so a group of five or six kind of formed a coordinating group for the heart and soul mm. group and mm. took it forward. Mm. Um, and actually that group, you know, people left and the energy in it has come and gone, mm. but that group mm -hmm. is still kind of coordinating um, Heart and Soul and changed its name now to Inner Transition. I, uh, I mean, I got very involved with the Transition Town Totnes project, not just with the Inner Transition part of it. And then Naresh and I set up the transition training. So um, Transition Network started kind of ridiculously soon after the TTT project got going. And we saw that there was a huge need for people wanting to know how transition worked. So we created a two day workshop. And in the design of that, I was really committed to including a big piece about inner, um, that, that we would really be modeling and teaching the impossibility of separating out what we do from what's going on inside us. Um, so Naresh and I put that workshop together, um, mm. and, I, and I think that was one of the it's key just, pieces. It really is a, it seems to me a crucial way in which the, from, that, from, our, from our beginnings, the inner dimension became woven into the entire transition movement as it went around the world, really particularly from your work in the developing the, the training. Yeah, so that was, that was a key, a key piece. piece. Uh, and I think, you know, when we started doing transition conferences, I wasn't involved in the first one. Um, but by the time of the second one, I could see that as well as having lots of workshops and having open space, there was a place for just, you know, encouraging everybody to sit and reflect and, um, and have some digestion time. So I was already seeing the tendency mm. in transition, isn't it, that we saw in Totnes, to do so much, you know, to be to be so speedy and to feel the urgency of the situation and not to pause and just reflect, you know, let things through your system. Mm. And so the conferences, that, that, that piece of the conference really grew um, and we've been on a big journey in Transition Network around our balance of doing and being, you know, how do we really create a healthy mm. organisation mm. that's not so so full on with the speed of the doing that we actually don't attend to good process yeah. within the staff team. Another way of saying it is this, this ancient question of means and ends. And if our goal is to practically, but also emotionally and in the way we feel in our lives, create a sustainable, happy human culture, that's where we're going, then our meetings and how we come together really need to reflect and be part of a healthy, happy human way of relating and uh, generating vision and action rather than be part of the old paradigm which is exhausting, stressful, urgent and maybe a little bit de depressing in which we have no place to feel our feelings because we should be stronger than that. Um, so I know that in Totnes, isn't it, we were very, very lucky um, wanting to bring this, this piece um, and in many of the other places that where, where transition took off early in the UK, they had a similar kind of field of a lot mm -hmm. of alternative activities, um, you know, a lot of therapy, a lot of spiritual practice. So, you know, there does seem to be something about um, working in a field like that that helps transition. And I think some of it is that people feel confident and able to step up and try new things. Um, I know in other places, inner transition has taken really, really different forms. Mm -hmm. So in some places, it's just a small group from within the whole transition project who come together and, and they don't offer particularly public events, but they form a support group for themselves. So they're doing their own practices around having space for feelings and discussions and deepening work. Um, in some places, uh, you know, we've seen things like Macy Mondays where there's somebody puts on a kind of um, a regular support activity that leaders and people taking responsibility in lots of different projects come along to. Um, and in some places, I, I think, you know, there are people that don't necessarily set up an inner transition group or they don't find a way for that group to, um, to work as a theme group. There's not enough energy and um, 
enthusiasm for that, but they're still bringing good facilitation to meetings. Okay. They're still bringing things about naming. You know, this this isn't just um, you know this isn't just facts. This is also information that has an emotional impact on us. How are we mm -hmm. feeling that? So I th you know I think there's really a, a place for inner whatever form it takes, and you know that the projects where the core group can welcome that and appreciate the value of it, tend to be the, the transition projects that have the most resilience. Mm -hmm. isn't it? That understanding, that real resilience comes not from one thing that's very, very strong, but from an I interweaving of taking care of all the different aspects of human life, mm -hmm. one of which is our emotional and physical and re relational well-being. I know people that have started in a transition project or heart and soul groups with a lot of enthusiasm and found it really difficult um, to get them to work. And one of the things that we saw in Totnes that I think is an ongoing um, issue for many people is that someone will come and go, I've got this thing and this thing is what inner transition is. It's Scott Peck's community building or it's Joanna Macy's work that reconnects or it's mindfulness practice. And, and I remember, you know, both practitioners wanting to use the kind of inner transition as a marketplace for their work, you know, and mm -hmm. saying absolutely rightly, all of this personal growth work is inner transition because it is, mm -hmm. and us trying to hold a boundary and saying, yes, it is that, and, you know, that our job was to keep opening the field and pointing to all of the things that make up inner transition. And I think that's part of the skill of holding an inner transition group isn't it is to keep saying yes and yes it's about um mm. co-counseling and it's about and, something and else. also alongside what you're saying it's all of these things but these things as they relate to the practical tasks mm. of moving to a sustainable society so we talked earlier a little bit about there being a split between inner and outer historically in our society and and even within the transition movement that we're trying to put the two back together and of course one face of that is that people who teach meditation or dance or do many, many of these things may not have been thinking about their carbon footprint, for example, mm. and that what we were constantly trying to support was what does it mean to put the two back together. So not only are the allotmenteers maybe um, doing a little bit of emotional sharing, but equally the meditators are at least questioning flying the other, to the other side of the planet for a meditation course, or beginning to yeah, change how they live environmentally. Mm. And I think that's, isn't it, that's one of the ways of framing inner transition that I think is really helpful, is to see that there are these two huge domains of change, one around environmental and social, and one that's around inner growth and spiritual and psychological kind of personal development. And this field in the middle actually is a really, really exciting place to work, and it's challenging, mm. you know, because you're trying to bring two things that, together that tend to polarise. You know, so each field sees its own part, but actually, you know, I, I think that is one of the places of real possibility to create um, real transformation is in that yes. place where they meet yes. and where they can start to see the value of each other. And, and when, when, you, when I think you asked that question, what, what would we say to people trying, starting one of these projects somewhere very different from Totnes? Um, I think it's really important to honour that there's both tremendous potential in putting those two things back together, but that also, almost by definition, it's not easy to do. There is a kind of resistance. There's a wariness of each camp for the other. I've heard that many, many times, that the real work is the practical work, or the real work is the inner work, and the other will follow. So that it's, it's, it's really to be prepared that if, as we do this work, we will, we will encounter resistance, but that's the nature of the... It's, it's the other side of the coin of the power of what we're doing. And, and to go back a step from the tremendous range of possibilities that, so, that you just described, Sophie, I'd say the, the important thing if anybody's drawn to do it is to kind of put out the call in some way, in newsletters, notice boards, wherever, and if two or three people come together saying, this, this calls me, just to follow that thread and see what wants to unfold.